Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this evening's event uh, from the Jesus College Intellectual Forum. It's great to have you here, whether you are here in person, this lovely Frankopan Hall, or you're watching us online, it's great to have you with us. Jesus has an amazing history. Uh, we originally set up as a nunnery in 1144 and have been through many changes since then, including becoming a college in 1496. There have been some amazing people here, many of whom we are rightly very proud of, some of whom we are rightly rather more concerned about and learning more about as we go. And that's the theme of tonight's talk. For, for a number of years, we've been looking at our legacy of slavery, and we have a legacy of slavery working party which has been looking at the history of people in the college and connected to the college. And it's a privilege, I guess, rather than a pleasure, uh, to host three events uh, to look at some of the aspects of that on behalf of the Legacy of Slavery Working Party. Um, in order to front this, I'm going to hand over now uh, to Véronique Mottier, who's been leading the Legacy of Slavery Working Party for all those years, uh, Veronique is a fellow here and a director of studies, uh, but is also a professor in Lausanne, where I believe the hills are better for climbing than they are here in Cambridge. Um, so I will now leave you in Veronique's capable hands for tonight's conversation about white debt and the Demerara uprising. Veronique. Thank you so much, Julian, and uh, welcome also to all the people who are following us uh, online. Um, it's an immense pleasure uh, to welcome this evening Thomas Harding, um, who is a journalist, documentary maker, and also a best-selling author. He's written a long list of extremely influential and interesting and thoughtful books on often difficult topics. Um, amongst these books, uh, The House by the Lake is probably perhaps the book that, most, that people are most likely to know. And also, um, of course, the book he's going to talk uh, about uh, to us tonight, uh, White Depth, which is a very, very thoughtful engagement with the kind of topics that we've been working on and debating for the past uh, couple of years. And uh, last but not least, I should say the most important is that his grandfather was, at at, uh, Jesus, was a student at Jesus College. <laughs> so, uh, so without further ado, I'll leave you the floor. And thank you so much for coming to talk to us tonight. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's a, a real pleasure to be here. And uh, I'm going to talk tonight about story, about narrative, about history. So t uh, this afternoon I had four experiences with story. I took a train from King's Cross and I saw a whole bunch of people lined up at Platform 9 and 3 quarters. I mean, where better to see the influence of like a book, a story? People were literally queuing up to have their photo taken um, on the way uh, uh, I had a taxi from Cambridge Station to here, and the taxi driver was telling me about the, the fight for the congestion charge here in, in Cambridge. And he was, he was definitely against the congestion charge. And he was saying, um, you know, you listen to one person, and you might want to hear what they have to say, but if you listen to two or three people, you need to start really listening. But if there's 10 people, he said, then you really need to uh, change, your, change your mind. At the Porter's Lodge, I met a very lovely porter, and uh, he kindly offered to take me to the room I was spending the night with. And he said, you're very lucky, he said, you've got the second best room in the college. So it's sometimes about how you tell a story. And then this afternoon when I had a few minutes, I was watching the, uh, the video, with the very moving uh, video when 2019's this uh, college handed the Benin bronze that the college had uh, back to Nigeria and an extraordinarily important moment, but also a story uh, when the master said that sometimes the most uh, simple symbols of truth uh, have to be followed. You know, if you've taken something from somebody, you need to give it back. These are stories and they're important because they are how we understand the world and the narratives that drive decisions. Okay, so that's a long way of saying I'm going to talk about stories tonight. Uh, I'm going to do three different parts. I'm going to talk a little bit about my family and the background of this story. I'm going to talk about the Demerara Uprising. Uh, this year's the 200th anniversary. Happened in 1823. I'm going to talk about what happened. 
And then I'm going to talk about the consequences, the impact, the legacy. I'm going to focus on this, this, uh, this title of this book, White Debt, quite controversial, quite punchy, uh, and talk about reparations. And then that should be about maybe 40 minutes. And then we'll have a chance to have questions and you can ask me anything about the book, about some of these uh, important topics. Uh, feel free to share your thoughts. Um, as Veronique uh, said, my, my grandfather was, as it happens, he went to Jesus College. And uh, I should tell you a bit, a bit about my family. So uh, my family are German-Jewish. Uh, my father's family were from Berlin and they left in the 1930s. Members of our family uh, were killed in the Holocaust. Uh, I've written a couple of books. One's Hans and Rudolf about my great uncle who was a German Jew and tracked down the commandant of Auschwitz. I wrote another book about the house by the lake, which is the house that was stolen from our family by the Nazis and has become a place of education and reconciliation in Germany. Uh, the Chancellor of Germany came a few weeks ago, the Israeli ambassador's been, Prince Edward's been, and we do interfaith work and dialogue work, trying to use the history of the past to talk about the future. So in my family, I was, when I was growing up, I was always told that we were the victims of history. Another book that I wrote was about uh, my mother's family. Now, I knew a little bit about my mother's family, uh, particularly my grandfather, Sam, um, their family, I don't know if anyone remembers the, um, the Lion's Tea Rooms, the Lion's Corner Houses, Lion's Tea, Lion's Coffee, Lion's Ice Cream maybe. Um, this was my mother's family. They had this huge catering empire. They were also from Germany, whether it was Prussia. They left because of the pogroms in the 1820s, 1819, 1820. It was a big pogrom going across that part of Prussia. They went to Holland, then Belgium, then to England. They arrived in the 1840s. And uh, uh, I knew about this lion's business, but what I didn't know was that before they had this catering empire, they had a tobacco business. And this tobacco business was called Salmon and Gluckstein. And uh, Salmon and Gluckstein was, was like the Starbucks of tobacco of the 19th century. They had hundreds of retail outlets selling tobacco. Karl Marx smoked their cigars. Uh, their marketing slogan, probably wouldn't work today, was smoke more, pay less. Probably wouldn't work today. Um, when I was writing about my mother's family, I began to think about the date, and it became quickly very obvious that if you're selling tobacco in the mid-19th century in Britain, almost certainly the tobacco came from the United States, and that meant that the tobacco almost certainly came from plantations worked by enslaved people. Well, suddenly the shoe was on the other foot. My family had made a lot of their money, if not all of their money, on the backs of people who were enslaved. We were now the perpetrators of history. Well, that was a very different place for me to be, and I, was, I took a while thinking about what that meant and what I should do, and, and I very quickly understood how little I knew. I don't know about you, um, but when I was at school, I was taught almost nothing about slavery. The triangle of trade, maybe, something about William Wilberforce, this great saviour who abolished slavery. I'm not sure I learned much more than that. And uh, I realised I had to educate myself. Uh, so that's what I started doing. Let me just show you a couple of... I'm not going to do many slides, but I just thought you, I should show you a few, uh, a few slides. Uh, this picture on the, your left is a picture of um, the rowing... What would it be? The crew? The eight? Uh, this is the thirds. Um, these, I, these were the oars on my uncle's wall um, from 1921-1922. I think it's the third team. And up here, if you see my, my, great, uh, my grandfather is at the back, second from the left, kind of with his hands kind of behind his back. And then um, he was part of this um, drinking club called the Roosters. I don't know if you've heard of the Roosters. Um, uh, and he was actually president of this drinking club. In 1922, you see he's president. I worked when I was writing this book. I got a lot of help from the archive here at Jesus. They're amazing. And um, uh, I'm just going to read this if you can't see it. Uh, it's totally ridiculous, but it says, 
Uh, this is their notes from Lent 22. The chief topic at private business and also underlying the debates was agriculture. It was even proposed to start a rooster farm, but the suggestion was ruled out by the president. It was decided that cleanliness is not next to godliness, that the office of proctor should not be abolished, that a bird in hand is not worth two in the bush, that all bicycles should have square wheels, you know, and, and on and on. It's, just to it's totally ridiculous. And it's, it's, it was a, a drinking club. A bit less ridiculous, um, they like to dress up, this is actually a picture from the next year. Uh, uh, this is the Roosters Bicentenary in 1923. By that stage, I think they had been, it was set up in 1907. So three, what is that? Three, 13, 16 years. They're basically, it's the 200th year anniversary after you know, only a few years, because they thought, why wait? And, um, but you can see there's at least one person in blackface on the far right hand side. Um, so this is the roosters. This is kind of the tradition um, my grandfather was part of here at Jesus College. Just thought I'd do a little. Okay, here we go. So this is on the on this is just the, the family story. You have got Jay Lyons on the top right. Um, these are the these waitresses were called nippies. There were these icons. There's actually, if you look up in the Oxford English Dictionary, there's a nippy. They're very much part of kind of. Uh, the milieu, a lot of the writers of the time would talk about it. The top left is the tobacco workshop where they were rolling tobacco. You've got, on the bottom left, you've got salmon and gluxine, you can just, just about see. Um, and this was a tin uh, from one of their, from one of their um, uh, tobacco tins. Okay, so moving forward. So that was my family's history. I wanted to find out about my family. I found out more about their role, how they made money from slavery, uh, and they made a substantial amount. And I was first of all thinking, okay, let me think about writing a story about my family and about the United States and about tobacco. And then I realized that that would take me away from Britain. Um, I, I, I felt like maybe if I knew anything, I knew a little bit about slavery in the United States, about the Deep South, I knew nothing about Britain uh, and, and slavery in terms of the empire, post, you know, um, at the time of uh, when my family was making um, their money. So I started looking around and started researching British colonial history, British empire, and I really wanted to see if I could find a story in which I could uh, tell it from various people's points of views, but most importantly from people who are enslaved. That was very important to me. And I write narrative non-fiction, and to do that I need enormous amounts of information. I don't make things up. So I need archive, large amounts of archive. And I, I searched and I searched, and then I came across this uprising which took place in 1823 in Demerara. If you can see the map here, I just gave you a little map. Um, right at the top of North America, <coughs> sorry, South America, you can see above the empire of Brazil. One, two, three, four. Can you see these numbers? Number one is Demerara. Today it's Guyana. It's known as Guyana. It's next to Venezuela. That, back then it was known as Demerara. And this is where the uprising took place. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the uprising and how I tried to approach it. Uh, you're probably much more familiar with this history than I was when I started, so forgive me for just giving you some basics. Um, 1823, uh, British Parliament was debating uh, slavery in the empire. Uh, 1807, they had abolished the slave trade, the Atlantic slave trade. When I started, I didn't know the difference between ab abolishing the Atlantic slave trade and slavery. Um, at this time, 1823, there's over 600,000 men, women, and children who were enslaved, 1823. And uh, though they couldn't transport people who were kidnapped in Africa across the Atlantic, the, the laws of Britain did allow uh, the sale and purchase of human beings between colonies, which is extraordinary to me uh, when I learned that. And in 1823, the British Parliament was, there was a fierce debate going on uh, between those people who were trying to abolish slavery across the British Empire and those people uh, who were trying to maintain it. I tried to tell this story from four people's point of view. One was somebody who grew up as a slave on a plantation. His name was Jack Gladstone. He was a young man um, who had been born into slavery because his mother was enslaved, so automatically he was enslaved. Uh, 
he was a cooper, he, was, he made barrels. This was a sugar colony, so they, they, they cultivated, one of the, it was one of the hardest crops to cultivate, it's brutal, uh, the high mortality rate, uh, and he was a cooper, so he made these huge barrels. So if you imagine like a, you, you're probably thinking about a barrel about this high, but he made hogsheads as well because sugar was so valuable that they used to transport the sugar from the plantations uh, back to Britain and other, uh, other countries in these enormous hogsheads. And the reason why is because you couldn't steal them. They were so big that you couldn't steal them off boats. So he used to make these. And that gave him a certain amount of freedom beyond what the rest of the community had. Because he would help transport these hogsheads, these barrels, to the port, he was actually allowed to leave his plantation, which was very rare. Typically, an enslaved man wouldn't, wouldn't be allowed. There's very strict rules, there'd be horrible punishments. So that was Jack Gladstone. Uh, his name was Gladstone because the, the plantation that he grew up in, that he lived in, um, was owned by a gentleman called John Gladstone. No coincidence that the name Gladstone, often that happened, the people um, who were enslaved were given, they had no choice, they were given the names of those who owned the plantations. John Gladstone, you may be familiar with that name, he was the father of the future Prime Minister, William Gladstone. He was the largest owner of plantations in Demerara. Um, there was over 2,000 men, women and children registered in his name, in the slave registers. Uh, he never went to Demerara, he never visited, but he made a huge amount of money, I mean enormous amounts of money. Um, when slavery was abolished, abolished in 1833, uh, as many of you will know, there was a compensation scheme where the British government compensated those who had people registered in their name. He was one of the largest, if not the largest, beneficiaries. So this guy really had an enormous amount of money. He was also head of the, I think it was called the West Virginia um, Association, which was like a lobbying group. Not West Virginia, what am I talking about? Sorry, not the West Virginia, the, um, the West Indies Association, or a lobbying group. I spent 10 years in West Virginia, that's why I said West Virginia. Um, and so he was also very involved politically. So that's uh, John Gladstone. The third person I talk about in this story is John Smith. He was a missionary, uh, um, not very well educated. He and his wife Jane went um, from Portsmouth to uh, Demerara uh, to help civilise. That was what they said, to help civilise the local people. Uh, but he was committed um, to uh, education. Uh, he became, uh, for all the writers who wrote about this history, he, they called him a martyr, the Demerara martyr. There's a couple of books where they actually describe him as a martyr. Uh, what's extraordinary about John Smith is that he actually kept a diary of his time there. So there's uh, probably 30,000 words describing four or five years of his time in the colony, which is very rare, um, where he not only describes where he lived, but he describes who he met and describes his feelings. He describes the horror of what it was like there. But you also see his racism. So often, well, up, the books that I read when I started this, they would describe him in these, you know, wonderful, uh, praiseworthy ways, you know, saying that he was a martyr, he was a saviour, he, you know, he supported those men, women and, uh, and children who were enslaved. But actually, if you read the text, he was also a racist you know, in terms of white supremacy. So that was very interesting. And I was very confused about that. You know, how can you be both, I mean, this might not be true for you, but for me, I was really confused. How can you be both an abolitionist and also a racist? Uh, well, it turns out that was quite common. I started reading more and more, and it turns out uh, this was actually quite a common thing, that like people who would be anti-slavery would also believe in white supremacy. So this was, that was him. The, third, the fourth person is a guy called John Cheverly. He's a really interesting guy. Uh, from a family of small farmers here in England. And just like many of the people of his uh, class, his parents sent him away to make his money. Uh, they, were, um, they lost their farm and they would send their sons overseas to make some money. He decided to go to, well, he, he got his first job he could find in Guyana. He worked as a store clerk. Again, we're really lucky. And you can see why this story interested me, because this guy also kept a memoir. So you're beginning to see some really interesting sources, as people interested in storytelling. And it's very rare to have a story where you can take it from multi-dimensional points of view. You know, so you can start building up layers for someone like me who's trying to tell the story. 
So he kept a memoir, and um, why he's interesting is not only does he describe it from a, um, a, a white uh, worker's point of view, he's not an owner of any of the plantations, he's not um, registered of having any enslaved people in his name, but he's very much part of the colonist class. class. Um, but when the, when the uprisings start in August 1823, he's enlisted. Um, everybody, all the white colonists have to join the, the militia. And he tells the story of the uprising and how it's being uh, suppressed. And at first, you can tell he's quite supportive of the idea. He's confused. He doesn't understand what's really going on. But then, from his memoir, he's clearly disgusted. Because what happens is the suppression of this uprising is brutal. Uh, somewhere around... 10 to 15,000 people took part in the uprising, which was the largest uprising up to that point in the British Empire. I mean, it's a significant number of people. Uh, Jack Gladstone is at the centre of it. He organises it with his colleagues, with his associates, with his family members. And what's really remarkable about it is because they're plugged into the networks around the Caribbean, because they've been monitoring the other uprisings, he is aware that uh, there can be, he and his, his colleagues are aware that there could be dire consequences uh, uh, if you do it wrong, because the other uprisings have been brutally suppressed. So they choose to be non-violent, which is really rare. And uh, they decide to be strategic. They decide to do it on a Monday, which is after a Sunday, where they would all met in church. They decide to do it um, simultaneously across the colony, which would put a disadvantage to the white militia because there's only a small number of people in the militia. So they're being really thoughtful about how they're doing it. Uh, unfortunately, though, uh, the militia is controlled by the governor, who suppresses them brutally. And somewhere between two and 500 people are killed. And, and John Cheveley, just, which is a, a, a large number of people, by, by the standards of, of what's going on then. Um, and, and in horrible circumstances, I mean, for me, I, I've written quite a lot about, and I'm not making an equivalence here, but it did, it did make, there were some echoes of what the Eisengruppen did in East Europe. They would line people up and they would just shoot them. Um, the people doing the firing weren't trained soldiers, they were volunteers, so they didn't do it in a, in a way that would take at least one, more than one shot. I mean, it was really awful. And John Cheverly described this in, in dramatic terms. So again, that's a really important source. The other source of information which was interesting to me uh, were the trial records. So again, quite unusually, we have access to the trial records. And the reason we have that is because John Smith, the white missionary, was accused of fermenting, of encouraging this uprising, this rebellion. And he was found guilty. He was put on trial himself and found guilty and uh, sentenced to life in prison. And when he appealed for clemency, that went all the way over back to London. Now, of course, that took six to eight weeks. You know, they didn't have DHL or whatever. And so then there was a time discussed in court, and then the by, by the time the response was given, which was another six to eight weeks later, John Smith had died in prison. So, and, and he was given a degree of clemency. His, his sentence was reduced. He was going to get banished uh, from the colony, but he died. And that's why he became a martyr amongst the, uh, the abolitionist campaigners here in Britain, especially amongst the, the um, organisers, the Christian-based organisers. Um, this is one of the earliest versions of, of, of petitions. So you'd have hundreds of thousands of people who were signing petitions supporting abolition. And John Smith became a, a symbol of that. And because of his story, because it was so mobilising for the ab abolitionist community, people then learnt about the Demerara uprising. And they learned about the horror. They learned about the stories. And then the, the trial of, of the, uh, the enslaved abolitionists, as I call them, enslaved abolitionists who took part in the uprising, their trial, their record of their trial, then became part of the campaign. So it became part of the dialogue. And so newspapers then started reporting what happened with the other trials, like for Jack Gladstone, like for the other people. So that's how we know his story because the whole record got transferred by the campaigners to Britain and then put into the House of Commons record. So Hansard, there was two days of debate in the House of Parliament about this because of John Smith 
and then of course because of the general situation. Um, but the trial record, the court record now, is you can find it online. It's amazing. And so that's how you can then see the details. So I was extraordinarily lucky to be able to then quote verbatim from dialogues. So you can actually say, here's what happened. Here's who said what to who. Now you have to have a degree of caution. You know, often these trial records weren't, were written down by a white clerk. Um, there might be some uh, manipulation, some distortions, but, but it's the best that we have. And it's a pretty, a pretty good record. So from that, you're able to tell this really interesting story. The actual uprising doesn't take more than a few days. Um, by the end of it, as I said, there's this horrible suppression. Uh, the trials go on throughout 1823, beginning of 1824. Jack Gladstone himself is banished, maybe to St. Lucia. We're not quite sure what happened to him. It looks like John Gladstone may have intervened on his behalf. And uh, the amelioration of, uh, as they called it, the amelioration of the conditions in Demerara uh, weren't, it was, were, they weren't implemented. Uh, it took another 10 years, 1833, for the first stage of the abolition of slavery to take place. As many of you will know, it actually didn't happen immediately. You know, the vast majority of those who were enslaved were, were kept, um, exploited through uh, apprenticeships or through other, some other device, so they didn't actually gain their freedom. And even then, they didn't really have access to uh, to land and, and, and so on. And then in, especially in, in Guyana and elsewhere you had an, another form of exploitation through what's known as indentorship, which was actually introduced by the same guy, John Gladstone. This time over 300,000 people from, the Indi from India uh, were brought over through exploitation and it was again the same guy, John Gladstone, because he was trying to fill the slots. You know, not a nice guy at all. Uh, so that's kind of, in a nutshell, the story of the Demerara uh, uprising. And I'm kind of gambling through this because I'm trying to get to some other stuff. Um, so, so two things to say about this from a storytelling point of view. You know, how do you try and tell a story today about some very difficult subjects 200 years ago? How do you find the sources? How do you make it relevant? These are things I was really interested in. I was interested in the story, but I was also interested in the legacy of what happened. How does it impact us today? How does it impact me? How does it impact you? And then who gets to say, who gets to talk about that? So I, in my journey, and that's what I do in my book, I go between this history and talking to people to find out what the legacy is today, both with people who are descendants of, of enslaved Africans, but also those who are descendants from slaveholders. The vast majority of people were white. Not all, but the vast majority of people were white. So I tried to talk to as many people as I could and try to learn and try and include those stories throughout this book. Uh, and then as part of that, I started uh, exploring what does that mean for my family as well. Uh, one of the things that I tried to do... Uh, I'm just going to introduce this to some Johns. There's so many Johns in this book, it's ridiculous. So the guy on the far left is John Gladstone. So he was the guy who owned the plantation. Uh, the guy at the top uh, is the governor, uh, John Murray. Uh, another nasty piece of work. Uh, the guy here, this guy here is uh, John Cheverly. He's the, the clerk. Up here we have John Smith. Um, I'm sorry, no, this is John Ray, another priest. John Smith is the missionary, and John Cheverly here. I told you they're all Johns. It's absolutely absurd. And uh, these are all contemporary pictures. So one of the things that, are, well, I, so I think pictures are really interesting when, I, when you're telling stories. I don't know about you, but I'm a visual kind of person. So having these pictures, I, 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 you know, what do you do? Because there's no pictures of the enslaved people, the enslaved abolitionists. Uh, so I was like, well, what do you do? Do you only use the pictures of the white guys? Which is what traditionally has been done. If you look at all the books of this story and most of these stories, uh, the pictures that are used are the ones, because of course they have the money, the power to commission people to write their portraits. They're the ones who can tell their own stories. Uh, the, 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 I should tell you the definitive book about this story, about the uprising, was by a guy called Joshua Bryant. It was written the year after the uprising. It's got these pictures, 
you know, someone's done some kind of hand-drawn illustrations. Um, it's very much from the colonist point of view, as you could expect. And I was, I was looking at the back of the book, because sometimes the most interesting thing, I don't know if you find this, but sometimes the most interesting part of a book is not actually in the book itself. It can be the edges. And the interesting thing about this, at the very end of the book was a list of what were called the subscribers. So back then, a book was often, you would pre-sell the book before you'd publish it, because you couldn't afford it. So you'd get people to say, oh, I'll, I'll take two copies, or I'll pick three copies, and you'd get people to subscribe beforehand. And so that's what the, he did. So there's a list at the back, and you can still find this in this book, of, again, available online, uh, a list of all the subscribers, and there's probably about 80 of them. And guess what? They are all members of the militia. They're all members of the British establishment. You know, captain this and judge that, and, the, and you can tell they're a planter class. And so, I mean, it's the clearest evidence you could ever need to have of how a history is being written by one side. In this case, it was the people who, you know, created the class, who suppressed the uprising. But going back to this, what do you do in this situation? So you've got three options as far as I could see. One is you do what everybody else has always done, use these pictures. Doesn't really seem right. Option two is you don't do anything. You have no pictures. Well, that seems kind of fair. That seems like a level playing field. But then I, for me, then you miss the opportunity to have a visual part of the story, which I think is important. So option three is you commission new artwork. So how does that work? Based on what? And who gets to do it? And who gets to decide? Right? So that's really interesting. So I reached out to, I went with option three. And I reached out to Guyana Speaks, which is a Diana, uh, Guyana, Guyanese diaspora organization. And they then put a tender out to Guyanese artists. And they said, because no one had done this before, no one had um, imagined what Jack Gladstone, this extraordinary man, this hero, as far as I'm concerned, no one had, had, had done a picture that I could find. At least no one else that I, could, I spoke to could find. And... Um, and so we had a few people send some stuff in, and so this is what came in, and, and I think it was really interesting. So this is, that's Jack Gladstone, as imagined by um, Aaron Brewster, who's a Guyanese artist. I don't know what you think, but I, I just think that's extraordinarily powerful, and, and it changes my view. But I, mean, I, I, I just, I, it just changes my, I can relate, I can imagine. You know, there could be many other imaginings of him. There's a, there we have some um, small amount of information. There was a wanted, they were trying to, after the uprising, they were trying to find him. They put a wanted ad in the newspapers and they described some of his features. So the artist had a little bit to go on, not very much. Uh, so that's Errol Brewster. And then I was talking to my friend um, Juanita and I said, hold on a second, so far we've only got men. There's no women. There's no female uh, colonists. You know, we don't have um, John Smith's wife, Jane. We don't have any female uh, abolitionists. And so we then we went, we went out again and we came up with a couple more pictures. So that's Jane Smith on the left-hand side by a different artist. And this is um, Amber, one of the... And now her name comes up in the trials, very briefly described. But that's Errol's idea of Amber. Uh, about a year into this project, I heard that the National Portrait Gallery was updating its permanent exhibition. And I knew, I'd worked with the National Portrait Gallery before, and I knew that they had 13 pictures of John Gladstone in the London exhibition, and they had 17 in the Scottish exhibition. They had photographs of him, pictures of him, I mean, just gobs of this stuff. So we approached them, and, they said, and we said, would you be interested in... In, in, in taking on Jack Gladstone and Amber, and they have. So now, if you go to the National Portrait Gallery, you can see John Gladstone next to Jack Gladstone, which is quite cool in terms of changing how we imagine things. Um, uh, we'll, do, we'll do all that in a second. Let's come back to that in a sec. Um, I said I was going to talk about I said I was going to talk about, um, in the last five, ten minutes, about the impact and legacy and reparations. And I'd be really interested to know what uh, you all think. You know, you've been doing some extraordinary work here. Um, 
really trailblazing, trailblazing work. And, and so part of what I was trying to do was to ask, okay, so what? So what does this mean? What does it mean? Uh, I said I'd talk a little bit about the title, White Debt. Uh, I had a long conversation about my publisher, about the title. There was a, quite a big argument about it. Uh, the, my publisher was a bit scared, if I'm honest. A lot of them were like, well, we don't, we don't want to cause controversy. And I said, well, look, how, how can you not call it white debt? Uh, when I went, to, I went to Guyana as part of this research process, and I met with um, the local uh, experts who looked at this history, um, Cecilia McCalmont and Vincent McGowan and uh, Alyssa Trotz, uh, Kibwe Copeland, Elsie Harry, uh, Nigel Westmass, and I spoke to them, and I, and I wanted to understand, because they've done a lot of research in this, and they were very, very generous in sharing their research and, and their materials. And then one day I went down to, um, uh, it was, they have an annual commemoration of, they call it Maafa, the, the commemoration of, of the African Holocaust is, is what they called it in Guyana. And I went with them to the shores of Guyana, down at the beach, and there's an extremely uh, moving ceremony where we, we put flowers in the water and remembered the 15 million people who had been kidnapped, transported from Africa to the Americas, over a third died. I mean, unbelievable. it's hard to get your head around. It's horrific. And um, extremely moving, and they were very generous to welcome me to this thing. And I, I was just, and I was sitting there thinking, hold on a second, how... How can you not call this white debt? How can you, the, the vast majority of the people who were involved with the kidnapping and transport of those Africans to the Americans were white. Those people who, the sailors, the people who owned the ships, the people who owned the plantations, who managed the plantations, the people who transported the materials, the commodities, the sugar, the coffee, the tea, the cotton, back to Britain. The people unloaded the ships, the, the insurance, the bankers, my family who made money from tobacco. The vast, vast majority. Yes, of course, there were some Africans, a small number of Africans who were involved in Africa. Uh, there have been apologies made by various presidents. Uh, there was a very, very small number of people of African descent who were slave owners of mixed race. But again, tiny, tiny proportion. So the vast, vast majority of people who benefited were white. So how can you not say that the people who are responsible ultimately were white and that therefore there must be a consequence. Surely there must be a consequence. That just seems so obvious to me. And when I was in Guyana, uh, people would say to me spontaneously, they didn't know my background, they said, well, the victims of the Holocaust, they, they received reparations. Why can't we? And people said that over and over again. And that really struck home for me because my family had received money from the German government. I had received money through my grandmother as a restitution. So how, how is it, I mean, these are different things, but how, how is the process not different? If, if one is true, why is the other one not true? So I, I started talking to my family about this. And... Um, at first, it was really difficult. It was a really hard conversation. And through my research, I, I actually had a very wide network within my family. I knew everybody's uh, contact details. I didn't know my, you know, sometimes you know one side of your family than the other. So my family, I know my father's family. You know, we grew up together, we went to parties and celebrations. And I didn't know my mother's family as much. But, you know, I had their contacts. So we started convening these Zoom calls. And they were really difficult conversations. But the vast majority of people were really interested. They wanted to understand. They wanted to educate themselves. However, there was a, a small number of people who didn't. And they were, tended to be older. And they were unbelievably angry. How dare you? How dare you tarnish the family's reputation? How dare you drag us through the mud? Uh, uh, this happened 200 years ago. There's so many more important things that have happened recently. Uh, gender issues, climate change, class. Uh, why are you picking on us? Why aren't you talking about these other families? You know, they, you just go through all these arguments, boom, 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 boom. And uh, it was difficult. I found it difficult having those conversations. These were people I loved. These were people I cared about. And they were really riled up. Uh, 
But the most of it, there was about 80 people in the conversation. And I would say about four or five were these people who were really angry and who wouldn't engage in a, in a constructive way. But the vast majority did. And we had a series of conversations, by the end of which uh, there was a recognition that we needed to acknowledge how our family had benefited from slavery and that we wanted to do more. That an apology is important, but it's not enough. It's not sufficient. As my friend Elsie Harry would say in Guyana, it's, it's an important first step. It's a necessary first step, but it's not enough. And so we started talking about what we could do. And at first, you know, there were people who were bouncing ideas around, let's do this, let's do that. And uh, then somebody said, hang on a second. We can't be deciding this. Surely we can't be deciding this. So again, if you make an equivalence, you know, you couldn't, the German government wouldn't be the one to decide how the money is spent for reparations. So yeah, the Jewish people who are receiving the money, they get to decide. So we made contacts to various orga uh, black organizations in this country, and uh, what we heard was education was important. And so there was a university who said, we'd really like you guys to help fund a PhD position, which is what we ended up doing. It was a small, modest thing that we did for somebody of Caribbean heritage, and they're just about to finish. It's three years, it was a three years fully funded scholarship. And uh, by all accounts, it's, it's been successful. They, they managed the whole thing, we raised the money. It was a small thing that we did, but the, the experience was very interesting. And there's a whole conversation, which I think is really interesting, is about how much is someone who's white, who's benefited from, our families benefited from slavery, should we be surfacing ourselves? How much should we be putting ourselves forward? How much should we be saying, hello, this is us? How much should we not be doing that? Like even talking about it now, should I not be talking about it now? The counter argument is, if you don't talk about it, then where's the accountability? Where's the role modeling? How do you try and make this more of a society-wide endeavor? So these are difficult conversations, tricky conversations, sensitive conversations, delicate conversations. Uh, but I think they're conversations that, that need to be had. Uh, so I'm just going to wrap up just, just with this, and then, then there'll be time for some questions. So here's just a... Actually, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go back to the beginning, to the, the, the first slide when you came in. I wanted to talk about this. How do I go back? There we go. Sorry. It's going faster than the machine can go. There we go. Okay. You probably saw this when you came in. So I just thought I'd put this up here because I think it's quite interesting. So there's the cover of the paperback with all these amazing positive <laughs> things. But on the right, there's, I thought I'd show you also some of the negatives, which often authors, I mean, typically you never get to see this stuff because authors don't want you to see this stuff. But I thought it was really interesting, having spoken this afternoon with Veronique, about some of the uh, narratives that are used to take down people working in this field. And Veronique and I were talking about this because these are used, the same, the same arguments are used again and again. Um, you know, who, how dare you, what right do you have to tell this story? Uh, you are, you know, you're not worthy, you're not educated. Uh, you've looked at one thing, but there's these other things that you've been looking at. Uh, you're stealing information, you're benefiting financially. You know, there are these arguments that are used. Often there, a lot of them have some kernel of truth, right? There's something legitimate in there. But I think it's quite interesting, just as how, how is this story received? Uh, and then we, we talked about a little bit about some of the things that have been experienced here, and, and that's, that's quite interesting about trying to share, uh, share those experiences. So I thought I'd just stop here, um, and then if you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to, to listen and to share and to hear what you have to say. Thank you so much. I think there's a microphone if anybody needs a microphone. There's a microphone here. Questions, comments? Yes, back here. We'll just wait for the microphone. Here we go. Here's the microphone. Yeah. In terms of, oh my God. Uh, it's quite loud. In terms of how a um, reparations would kind of revolve in like a state level, like let's say the British sure. government, let's say yeah. the British government agrees to do reparations, how would you think that? Right. Like financially and economically, and yeah. how would that work? Yeah, so I think, I mean, that's, a, that's the kind of question that I am probably the least qualified to answer for lots of reasons. First of all, I'm a white person whose family has benefited from slavery. 
Second of all, people who are far smarter than me and who much more experience have looked at this have. The only thing I would say is, um, if you're interested, go to the CARICOM 10-point plan, which is the Caribbean community 10-point plan, and it lays out a kind of step-by-step, -step, uh, you can find it easily on Google, um, of, of interstate uh, international reparations, very much looking at from the state point of view. Um, uh, the African Union has done some work on that as well, um, so that you know you can look at that. As far as I know, there's been no uh, reparations between states yet um, in this in this slavery world. There has been, as I've been talking about, from Germany uh, for the Holocaust, uh, both both individually uh, to individuals through intermediate organisations and then through Israel, and they also have supported. Um, Jewish people in the East, that, um, America to the Japanese community, um, Germany recently, I think, to Namibia. Um, and you know, there's these kind of pockets of kind of, of history. But uh, really, uh, have a look at CARICOM, the 10-point plan. That's a really good place to go, I think. Yeah. Do you think that... Um like a, a narrative form is has been more helpful for discussing the story of enslaved people and perhaps kind of more discursive and openly analytical historical work. Huh. Okay, so uh, I mean, I write narrative nonfiction. I've done journalism in the past, but I, I'm I'm interested in writing books that a wide audience can, is interested in reading, and so I'm I'm personally less interested in dry history. I, this dry history is fantastic academic history, what the Germans call scientific history, which I struggle with that, that expression. Uh, so I'm really interested in using fictional techniques, so narrative arcs, character development, um, setting, tone, colour, detail, using some of those telling these stories, partly because I'm just interested personally, but I also think as a device to to communicate complicated, difficult, nuanced history, it can be successful. It can also be not successful. Um, I, I like historical fiction. So it's not, it's like the other side of that line, isn't it? Of that kind of, and where is that line? Like the truth line, you know, I don't know. Um, so I think as, you know, I've, I've, I've had some people at some events who've said to me, thank you for writing it uh, in this way. It's easy to read. And therefore, it's giving access to people who don't actually normally have access, or often have access, I should say, to this kind of history. But it's horses for courses. I think other people are really interested in other, you know, it could be poetry, it could be art. I mean, there's, no, I mean, there's many different ways of talking about this. You know, I don't know if that answers your question. What do you think? What do you think about using narrative nonfiction to talk about this kind of history? I suppose it kind of, it, as you say, it gives a, a more accessible route in for people to kind of understand and possibly more of the emotion to a yeah. kind of issue than... I mean, I think it's also particularly interesting in, in with histories where there's a scarcity of data as well. Um, I'm trying to think of the name of the book. Somebody else will know the name of this book. Um, oh, what's it called? It's a book about the Angelus Sack. Does anybody know the name of this book? Came out of the, the National Booker Prize, anybody know? Um, it's, a, it's an extraordinary story, which I'm going to tell you in 10 seconds, which is basically a, an enslaved woman gives a sack, her name is Rose, to her daughter Ashley. And she says, it's a true story, she says, um, as they're being sold, separated, terrible story, in the States, says, um, here's a few items, she lists some items, and then she also says, and this sack is full of love. I mean, it's really powerful. Here's the sack full of love. And then the, Ashley, the daughter's daughter, tells this story and she, she writes on the sack this story. And that's it. And the historian is incredibly honest and says, that's basically all I know. I've tried to find the rose. I've tried to find the Ashley. I've tried to find the punt. And they, she can't find any of this. But extraordinarily, with that, almost, almost no more information than that, she's able to write a 450-page book and I think she won the National Book Prize in the States. And part of what she does is she provides context. And, you know, she'll, similar stories. You know, we don't know her story, but we know a similar story. That's one device, which is quite clever. 
And then she, she, the other thing she does is she does known history. Right, here's the background. Well, you can imagine that's quite easy. But then she has a third thing, which I think is really important with histories where you literally can't get the data, which is she imagines. Now that gets really tricksy, right? But she uses mites and maize and perhaps, and she makes best guesses, she estimates. Two plus two equals four. Because, and this is the point she makes, is if you don't do that, then you can't tell the story and then this person's history doesn't get heard. And I think that's a really powerful argument. So that's kind of a narrative. So she's using some of those devices as well. The difference is she's revealing at every moment, she's surfacing, she's revealing what she's doing. And I think that in itself is very interesting. It's the book, All That She Carried. Thank you. All that she carried. Um, can I just bring a? <coughs> excuse me. Can I just bring a question from online? Yes. <coughs> if anyone else has any, please do put them in using the Q and A feature. Who's it by, by the way? Although it doesn't say. It, anonymous attendee. Okay. The, the friend of yours. Or, okay. Um, uh, really nice talk. Do you think reparations will actually happen, and if so, when? Yes. Very soon. I also think. I mean, I'm an optimist. I just think it's inevitable. You know, this is such a colossal wrong. I mean, it's an appalling and appalling and appalling and taken over hundreds of years, affecting millions of people and their descendants, hundreds of millions of people, involving mass transfers of powers and wealth, enormous amounts of trauma, which has been inherited. I mean, I know, I know a little about inherited trauma. It's, again, it's not the same, but in my family, we have inherited trauma. So I know a little bit about inherited trauma. This is real, real stuff. You can't forget this stuff. And one of the things I try and do in my book is I try to explore the legacies of some of these abuses and the atrocities, how it affects people in terms of their health outcomes, their economic outcomes, their educational outcomes. These are real legacies of slavery today. So I think it will happen, it must happen. Uh, and I think we're, gonna, we're starting to see that. In this, I think in the States you can see it happening in a slightly more accelerated way. But I think in this country, you're beginning to see it. You're beginning to see it with Glasgow University saying they're going to give 20 million pounds worth of reparations. Uh, I think they contribute to the University of West Indies. You've got Lloyds Bank and you've got, um, you've got various, the churches, the Bank of England, and you've got universities, other universities are exploring their past. And you've got families who are beginning to put their hands up and say, you've got the heirs of slavery and you've got all these various individuals and it's happening at different levels. So I think, yes, I think it's going to happen. I mean, I predict, and I probably shouldn't, but um, I think the royal family are quite close to doing something significant, whether it's a, an apology. I don't have any knowledge of this, so, you know, uh, take it with a pinch of salt, but I think an apology plus something. You know, they've already started exploring their own archives and giving people access to their archives. It would not surprise me in the next five years we see some form of apology, some sort of effort towards repair of harm. Something, whether it be money, it might be transfers of information, it might be resources towards further research. So I think, I think so, and I'm an optimist. I'm not saying it's going to be easy because when it comes to power, if you're trying to really shake things up, if you're trying to overturn centuries of entrenched power, it's not going to be easy and you're going to get pushback and you're going to get people who use dirty tricks and you're going to be people who don't like what you're doing and they're going to be attacking you who's trying to change it. Microphone over here. Thank, oh, there, yes, definitely on. Thanks so much for your talk, really interesting. I was curious, uh, you were talking earlier about the, the Zoom calls with your family and there were some members of the family who were just on, on a very far side and it, clearly they're not even gonna kind of try and come to the middle. Uh, and I'm, I'm wondering, do you think that there's a tipping point that might get those individuals to come closer to the middle or to understand where you're trying to get to or where you know, the world really should uh, get to? Is it worth spending time and energy and resource to, to turn those folks around? Because it does sound like it was a small group uh, or is it just, just crack on and keep going? Is, is there really any effort uh, worth spent there? Are you asking about my personal family? Just in general. I mean, if you talk about my personal family, I mean, the, 
these are complicated relationships. These are real relationships um, built over decades. And uh, yeah, absolutely. And I'm a big believer in dialogue and uh, reaching out and being making yourself vulnerable and leaning into that vulnerability and using in a safe kind of situation, safe context, trying to bring people together. Uh, it's something that we try and do in Germany with this project, the Alexander House. Again, it's different, but it's some of the same techniques. Uh, but at the same time, you have to be realistic. My aunt would say you have to meet people where they are. And if they're not there and they're not ready and they're not interested, they're not open, you know. Uh, and where we got to, which I think was quite a healthy place, which was people said, if you want to go ahead and do this, you can. And if you don't, you don't need to. You're not talking about half of the family. So I'm, I, I'm never talking about half of the family. I'm talking about half of myself. And we all have our own stories. You know, we get our own, we get a chance to write our own story. So it's both an individual thing and it's a community thing. You know, it's all these, these two things, you know, and it can be changing and then be very organic. I don't know if that's helpful. Yeah. Hi, thank you for a fantastic talk. Um, how do you think this discussion might be able to brought, be brought into other discussions where there's been other mass movement or removal of people, say Spain in the 13th, 14th, 15th century, or even currently what's going on around the world, where do you structure that? Is there a, you know, a hope for a foresight for other yeah. movements? Yeah, I mean, that's a hard question, isn't it? It's, uh, uh, I, mean, I think there's, there's a temptation, I mean, certainly for myself, to try and find patterns. You know, we're, we're humans after all. You know, we're limited by our own human anthropological opportunities. At the same time, I think there can be a danger by trying to oversimplify, by trying to always make an equivalence between situations. I mean, what happened to the enslaved Africans is different from what happened uh, to the Jews of Europe, is different from what happened to the indigenous people of North America, and so on. You know, I think, and, and people try, to, there's some temptation to get into a kind of a pecking order of appallingness or atrocity, which I'm not sure is very helpful, or um, try to take lessons from one thing to another. However, you know, I think there are some things that you can try and pull together. I was talking to um, this woman who was the granddaughter of one of the largest, uh, the largest he was one of the worst uh, Nazi leaders in, I think, Slovenia. He was in charge of deporting 70,000 Jews to the death camps. And she grew up with this. And I said, what was it like? You know, and she said, no one talked about it. And if they did talk about it, he was seen as a victim. I said, what do you mean a victim? She said, well, he was actually hanged. He was one of the few Nazis who actually was sentenced to death, was hanged. So kind of poor us because, you know, and I said, OK, <laughs> what was that like? She said it was, it was terrible, nobody talked about it. And I felt there was this toxic silence. And, and she told me, she began telling me that she had started doing uh, communication, that she started researching it, educating herself, and actually started talking about her, what her grandfather had done. And I said, so do you feel responsible for what he did? And she said, how can I be responsible? I was born after he died. But she said, what I can be responsible for is silence. I could be complicit in the silence. And that's happening now. If I say nothing now, if I don't talk about it now, if I don't reach out, if I don't make an effort to educate people about what my family did, this is her talking, then I'm complicit. I thought that was a very interesting separation of responsibilities. You know. So I think those kind of things maybe we can learn from, those kind of, those kind of lessons, if that makes sense. Other questions, thoughts? Yeah. So it seems kind of the way you were talking about like Guyana and being able to go there yourself. How did you... Um, understand your positionality as a descendant of slave owners in a community of people who are descendants of those who are enslaved and how did you build that relationship yeah. with like truthfulness but also um, 
understanding the power dynamics that come with going into a community that has been disenfranchised for yeah. so long. So I'm going to answer that in three different ways. So first of all, absolutely, that's the obvious question. And I talked about this at length with this woman, Elsie Harris, um, um, uh, who, um, I mean, she was just incredibly generous with her emotions because she, she was like, what are you going to do? Just steal our history like all these other Europeans and take it back and write this book and make some money and, you know. And um, I said, no, that's not what I'm going to do, but I totally understand why you're saying that. And what would be helpful? And how can I contribute? And here's my story. And we related as human beings, you know, not trying to cover over that. Uh, and so, so in my book, for example, there is a chapter about me talking to the local experts, trying to surface, trying to acknowledge all this enormous amount of work that they've done before I've even turned up. And their expertise, far beyond the expertise I would ever have, Elsie Harry. And um, I mean, we became, you know, fast friends. You know, I was, I'm just writing a book about, a picture book about, um, do you know Harriet Tubman, the conductor of the Underground Railroad? So I'm writing a children's book about her house, which is upstate New York. And I, I was meeting with a guy called Paul Carter, who's this extraordinary guy. He's the, he's the guy, the tour guide. And he does this wonderful performance when people come and he explains what's going on. But he does it in a wonderfully charismatic, animated way. And afterwards, I chatted with him, and I said, Paul, just be honest, what do you think about me, a white guy, writing this story? And I, I, what he said I thought was really helpful, for me anyway. He said, look, I would prefer if it was an African-American. But African-Americans aren't sitting opposite right now. You are. So I'll do what I can to help you. you know, and I'd ask that you're respectful and, and you try and do this in the right way. So I think this is, that's the second way of saying it. And the third thing is to say this is also our story. Uh, this is a white people's story in that we are the perpetrators and we need to take responsibility. You know, uh, Veronique and I were talking about this earlier, that uh, it's, it's when I was in Guyana learning about what Jack Gladstone did, what Amber did, for me, they're my heroes. I mean, they brought freedom to me, not just people who are descendant of Africans. I feel that they contributed freedom to my life and that our family were the ones who were the perpetrators. You know, that this is an intricate, intricate, complicated human story. There's also a system problem, which is the fourth thing, which is without doubt there's underrepresentation of voices, that there needs to be opportunities for diverse voices to be heard, and a thousand percent. So, how do you do those two? How do you do those things at the same time? How do you make sure that people like me have an opportunity when historically white men have been the ones dominating publishing and writing and history? But at the same time, other people have an opportunity to have their voices heard as well. These are complicated things. I would like to think there's enough space with intentionality and with thoughtfulness that we can all have our voices heard. You know, it's difficult though, and I'm glad you raised it because it's, it's, it's difficult. And hopefully, 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 I've got the balance right. But I'm sure I haven't. You know, it's difficult. More questions, thoughts. Yes, at the back. How are we doing for time, by the way? Are we good for time? One, one more after this, maybe. Um, Hi. Thank you very much. Um, um, I, I would like to, uh, to ask, uh, um, in slavery, actually, um, okay, um, when, when this, this, um, this system of slavery ends, we, uh, um, it always changed to the so-called indenture. Yes. So uh, um, by this means, actually, when uh, they, uh, during this uh, slavery time, I mean before 1833, 23, did, did, did they have the, that, uh, that kind of indenture or the, uh, how about the, 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 the change from uh, slavery to indenture after that? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Before I answer that question, I feel that you should answer, you should answer your own question first. Do, would you mind giving your thoughts? 
about that. Would you mind? Would you Would you mind? I feel like you should have a chance to. I'll come back to that in a sec. Yeah, just to like answer my my. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd be interested to know what you think. Um. Yeah, I think that. Um, I. As you said, I think it's important to have intentionality and thoughtfulness within interacting with um, people who uh, have, you know, experienced a lot of trauma. I think also understanding the impact of having to, like, explain or reopen kind of a wound um, of, like, ancestral pain and generational trauma and um, also just, like, the current present idea of, you know, being low income or, you know, not having access to resources and all of these things can like really be tracked down to slavery. And yeah. so what does that mean to be a developing country? You know, people don't talk about Guyana as being, you know, a superpower and like there's a reason for that. Um, and I'm not saying that that's what we should put as like the neoliberal want to be that but um i think understanding as you said connecting as human to human is super important and seeing people in their fullness yeah. um is a necessary and so i think the work that you're doing and and the reason why you wrote it is like so important um and i think as you said it's also important to recognize um there are voices that have been silenced and Absolutely. publishing and things like that have not given room for people who have either firsthand accounts of things or ancestral knowledge to be able to say those things um, and have a wider audience listen to them. And so I think it is holding both and recognizing that we don't also live in a system in which people do wanna hold both. And so what does that mean? Yeah. Um, for all of us to then cultivate that space. Because I don't think that space is actually current. I think that it's something that we're still fighting for. I mean, holding these two things at the same time, right? I think, I don't know why humans find it so hard, but apparently we do find it hard. And that's why I hope we can get better at. I think holding more than one thing at a time, that seems to be so much of our problem. So thank you for that. Okay, to answer your question about indentorship, and if you'll, if you'll bear with me, I want to read something after this. So on indentorship, um, I think it's really super interesting. As far as I understand it, I think indentorship has been going on for centuries, right? Just like slavery has been going on for centuries. But if we talk about this particular Americanized indentorship, as far as I understand it, it really was invented by John, John Gladstone. So we have letters from, from him writing to his friends, his colleagues in Calcutta, saying almost verbatim something like, my plantations need labor, because brackets, he didn't say this, all the descendants of African slavery, they've, they've, they've moved off the land. Uh, this place is a paradise. We provide education and health and clothes and come to this paradise and you'll end up with land. Brackets, please send lots of people so I can exploit. And he organized, I mean, he really invented this kind of indentorship, which it wasn't just for Demerara, but also Trinidad and Tobago and other Caribbean islands. Uh, the, the indentured um, workers didn't just go to his plantations, they went to other plantations around Demerara, but a lot of them started with his. And if you read these early reports, I mean, the exploitation is horrific. I mean, it, it's not slavery, but it's not so far off from slavery. The mortality rates were really high, the illnesses, the sexual exploitation. I mean, it's, and you hear that in the Indo Guyanese stories. And Guyana is super interesting if you know about Guyana. It's 40% now Indo Guyanese, 30% Afro Guyanese. Uh, there's quite a large Chinese population, Portuguese population, mixed race population, indigenous population. But the largest is actually Indo Guyanese, what they call Indo Guyanese. And of course, that brings its, all its own political fighting. There's been horrible violence between these various sectors of society for decades now. So that, I mean, that on top of slavery was another layer of atrocity, exploitation, horror, abuse, you know. And, and, and then more recently, Guyana is now the fastest growing economy in the world because various oil companies have found oil and gas off the coast of Guyana. Um, you've now add that onto the whole toxic layer. 
If you, if you would bear with me, I'm just going to read something from the end of my book and then we'll probably finish. Um, this is just from the very end of my book. I just thought this would be a good way to wrap up this evening. It's, hopefully it won't be too long. And the light is light enough for me to read with my bad eyes. Okay. This comes from the postscript. On my last day in Guyana, I met with Kibwe Copeland, the 28-year-old president of ICEMBA, the first youth reparations organization in the Caribbean. It's early, just after sunrise, an area of scrubby grassland the size of four football fields. This is the place where more than 50 abolitionists were executed in the autumn of 1823. At the far edge, a group of men play basketball. Other than that, the place is empty. We are here to remember those who took part in the uprising. We take off our shoes and stand barefoot on the damp earth. We talk for a few minutes about the uprising, the trials, and how those found guilty were marched through the streets to this ground. Kibwe then reads out the names of those who were executed here. Alec, Attila, Bethany, Billy, Damas, Daniel, Evan, France, Hamilton, Harry, Harry of Good Hope. After each name, he pours a few drops from a bottle of water onto the ground paying respect to the ancestors, and then says, Ashe, or, and so it is. And then he keeps going. Harry of Triumph, Lewis, Murphy, Natty, Nelson, Philip, Pickle, Quamina of Newtonzal, Quintus, Scipio, Tom. After he is finished, we stand silent for a few minutes. Then Kibway says, if it wasn't for them, I would not have the freedom of speech that I have. I would not have been able to walk as a free man. Because of their sacrifices, I can. Later, as we are heading home, I ask, what can British people do about this history? Slavery happened so long ago, he says, but we are still living with the side effects today. So many problems that we face today exist because we never properly dealt with that issue. So, reparations, I ask. And he says softly, if you're against crimes against humanity, then you must support reparations. If this had happened to your family, you would want to be compensated. Why not the descendants of Africans? who are enslaved. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for a fantastic talk, inspirational. And thank you so much for coming. And uh, there are some books for sale if you're interested. And otherwise, take a look as well. There are some other books as well. Uh, and this is the end of the evening. So thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas and Veronique, and that's all we have tonight. But just very quickly, we have lots of other events coming up. Um, so just the next couple of weeks, we've got uh, historian Sheila Fitzpatrick on Friday talking about Soviet Union history, uh, displacements and memories of loss. Uh, then next week, we have Lisbeth Rousing talking about Britain's organic farming pioneers and what went wrong. Uh, then on the 22nd is the next in our Legacy of Slavery uh, talks, talking about the afterlives of Caribbean slavery. Uh, so that's here on the 22nd. Then Ros Atkins from the BBC on the 30th, and that takes us to the end of the month. So um, hopefully see you again at something here. Do buy some books, and thank you both very much. Thomas, great to have you with us. Thank you.